my my first comment really fast is for Ben. You let me know if that agency uh, comes up for renewal because I think I know someone who might be able to help you with a better idea. That's my first point. Um, <clears throat> When I was thinking about what to talk about here, I'm actually gonna I'm actually gonna correct Alex, which is a little bit wrong to do, but I think it's appropriate. When we talk about accessibility, accessibility and the difference and distinction between inclusive comes down to a checklist versus a methodology. So if you think about accessibility, when we look at it, I could probably run most of your websites, I could run most of your digital projects, and what we would do is we would get a checklist, like boop, 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 done, got it, you scored A, B, C. The reality and the methodology that we're talking about today comes in this idea around inclusive design and really puts it into the lens of the mismatch. Now, I don't know if any of you guys, but I grew up in Seattle, Washington, where it rains constantly. I was not a great student, but I can tell you what my favorite part of the day was. Afternoon cartoons. Toonami was like live and die. I don't know if anyone knows Toonami. Dragon Ball Z was like the best thing in the entire world. It didn't matter that it took an entire three episode story arc to power up, I didn't care. There's this idea though that in every single story that we interact with, there's this idea and concept of the mismatch. I'm a big nerd, so we're gonna let it on display here. If you think of Frodo versus Sauron, right? Mismatch. You think of in any type of, any type of story, Thanos, if you wanna get into the new Marvel universe, Thanos versus anybody, mismatch. All of these things are mismatches that we see every single day. Now, these mismatches can be exploited like this particular, which I have a lot of family in Utah, so this was actually a little jab at them. But if you watch here, this is the classic example of the mismatch in basketball. It's hilarious to watch, and it's a little embarrassing. Because of the difference is, is that one person is out of their comfort zone asking to play in a spot that they're not comfortable with. So the other player can just obliterate them with their speed. Now, this would drastically change in a role reversal. If we can imagine, he's probably going get, like, to get stuffed to complete end if he drills in on there and Gobert is sitting in the key. So the real question, though, is how does this actually pertain in our daily lives when we think of digital experiences, when we think of life experiences? And that comes down to one critical understanding. It's where do we identify mismatches? So this is a good example of a mismatch if you look at the staircase. Someone who has a, in a wheelchair, this is a mismatch. This is a mismatch they deal with every single day when they walk and experience the, the world around them as they're, as they're moving through the world. This one right here, with thank God, no one, no one from Apple's here, right? Okay. Okay, sorry. This was, the, this was the worst idea ever, and I don't know if anyone ever feels this way, but it was horrible. And it, because it provided the worst possible mismatch, Everybody in this experience, we're using physical keys and also, oh, just kidding, that's actually a touch button. Oh, physical keys, just kidding. But you know what? It looks fancy in this video with a cat paw and the kid in the cast. And we got it. We were like, oh, we're so excited about this. But it wasn't a good match in a human interaction for anybody. Now, thank God Apple reversed this because I have the new MacBook Pro and it's a dream. So there's my plug for that. Um, this also comes into other mismatches within the way that we think about other physical products, shoes. Think about getting on a pair of shoes can be quite cumbersome depending on your skill level, whether you're a child, whether you're an elderly person, whether you're in a cast, if you've ever broken your hand, all those types of circumstances, that becomes an obstacle, it becomes a hurdle. The other piece of this is doors. Now, Pikachu right here, poor Pikachu, is trying to get through this door. But the reality is, is that for so many people, we experience this particular mismatch on a daily basis. I don't know if you've ever tried to leave Starbucks or Tim Hortons with a bunch of coffee and a bunch of stuff, and you're like, oh, shit, this is not happening. And you're, like, and you're sitting there waiting, like, who's going to open the door for me? This is the classic mismatch that we see every day. And the reason why this is because we believe a lie. We believe the lie that there is an average user. There isn't. Every single one of us on a daily basis is layered. We have tons and tons of layers and tons of ways that we experience the world. The biggest eye-opening thing for me with this was becoming a parent. I was like, I've lived my li I'm living my life as like one person, then getting married to my partner, then having a kid. The changes in evolution in the way that you flow through the world is on constant display. Strollers become cumbersome objects. Taking your kid to Disneyland, you might as well just bribe them with anything else because it is horrible. All the experiences that you go through, no matter how hard you try. Now, I also live in New York City, 
which if you've ever tried to go to the bathroom in New York City, I mean, come on. Like, it is the hardest thing in the entire world. We're constantly experiencing this. Other ways that we think about this, too, is even on our digital devices. We're not so nuanced. If you think about, I want to read on my phone, and I'm going through my day, and I might have my phone in light mode, right? Then it's going to turn into night, and I want to switch it to dark mode. Now, does every app that you interact with turn to dark mode? Has anyone ever been sitting in bed trying to read something in the dark with, like, anyone? And you're like, why the hell is this just, like, glaring on me? Am I going to get a, like, tan from Safari, trying to read something on Safari? It's horrible. And that's really what happens to us on a daily basis. We are more nuanced. Our specific objectives and the way that we view the world is constantly and rapidly changing. So really the question is that we're going to get into is how do we solve the mismatch? That's something that's plagued tons of digital, and you've probably all interacted with it. A product that doesn't work right, a dead end in a user flow, a physical product that breaks or doesn't work the way we anticipated. So the first part in establishing this, and Microsoft um, and Starbucks, who Starbucks is one of our clients, they're doing a lot of really good work in this space, and they're, and they're doing it in a very democratized way. They're getting all tons of partners because the goal isn't here to win. There's no winning in this scenario. There's more. And it's constantly exposing that and collaborating with other partners. So Microsoft, in this really interesting use case, this is from their Inclusive Design Toolkit, um, they have this, si this slide here that's always stuck out to me. On a personal note, my, my wife's mom has one leg. So she had cancer when she was younger, and she had her leg amputated. And so for, since she was 18 years old, she's had one leg, and she's moved through the world in that way. And there's this interesting idea around this idea that she is viewed through the world as a disability, as a specific health condition. And so we try to optimize based on those examples. Now, that's a really great place to start. The evolution of that is looking at disabilities not as a specific health condition, not as something you can see that you can interact with and that you can notice, but they're identified as mismatched human interactions. That's critical. This mind shift, this is why at the beginning talking about this isn't accessibility, because accessibility is a checklist. Inclusive methodology is about solving this particular problem. This is a really great um, little graph that they have made, a little illustration to showcase this. And this hits on a little bit of this, where if you imagine if someone is hard of hearing, so if they are, you might have someone who's, a, who's deaf. They can't hear at all. Now, that same situation for an ear infection, you could not be able to hear very well. And then you also think about a bartender. If you design your software products, any type of situation, with all of these in mind, each time, and you're looking at this saying, okay, now I think about a bartender. Now, how does my point of purchase product accommodate this particular scenario? How does my physical environment accommodate this area? And that's what's happening is that they're not doing that. All point of purchase, no matter the circumstance, is the same flow. And it creates this interesting struggle on a daily basis. So all of these different factors, <clears throat> excuse me, play into the way that we experience the world and the way that we try and solve mismatches. <clears throat> a good example of this is actually Nike. So Nike, when, if you guys are familiar with this, so Nike took this head on. And so in Nike's view, this isn't just like some glamorous, like, oh, this is good for the world. It's, that is true, but it's also good for business. So there's an estimated 1.6 billion people in the world who have some form of mismatch. Not a disability, but some form of a mismatch within the way they're interacting. Now that number is taking people in a permanent sense. That's not taking any situational, that's not taking any temporary, and they're putting them in that slot. So if you imagine that number, it's quite large based on the way that, that we can see different products interact. So Nike actually took this initiative and they collaborated with a company called Kizix to create these hands-free shoes. Now, at first, this was launched, and it was the idea was like, we're going to help people. And that was their whole thing. This particular sneaker sold out online so fast because all the sneakerheads were like, well, this is amazing. I need this. And so this has this byproduct. It's like you're creating demand, you're creating growth, and it's creating something that is filling this void in a, that, again, that circumstance, if you remember on this slide, we made something for someone on the left, but it worked for everybody down to the right. And that's what we're really striving for when we look at these principles. So in a, quick in a quick sense, it really comes down to control. The idea is giving control and offer choices. That's our first step that we want to think about when we're evaluating and looking at our products. The next part is being consistent and consider the situation. 
too often we, something you, we talk about is intention. You talked about in yours and Google about the, about the time, the right time. It's all these, what's the intention? What's that moment that you're going to get to? And that comes down to the situation. That depends wildly on how we design and how we move through our products and through the story that we're telling. The next piece is talk to the mismatched users. There's this interesting thing that when I was talking with our uh, head of inclusive design at Starbucks, and she and I were talking, and she says, there's this point in which empathy can be misleading. And that sympathy that we look at it, we go, oh, that's so hard. But she's like, the, the, it's through the lens that we don't have the mismatch, so we can't relate. It's critical to talk to people. It's critical to make those connections and understand what the actual need is. There's so many times where things have been developed to solve a problem only for that group to go, that's not a problem. And that's what we really have to be cautious of because really in this circumstance, when we factor in design, to design it this way costs no more money than to design it the other way. It really doesn't. It's not any harder. It doesn't take any more time. It's not a time, con it's not a time constraint. It just comes down to a lack of understanding in the way that we understand the world as mismatches, not as disabilities and not in this lens of traditional view. The last thing here is I would be really, really sad if I told you this is the biggest misconception that it should be ugly. People think, it's, I, don't, I can't make it accessible. I can't make it based off inclusive design. I can't do all these things because then it's going to look like what? It's going to look like a AAA compliant website. It's going to look like black text on a off-white screen, and that's all we're going to think about it. That couldn't be further from the truth. There are so many ways to adopt inclusive design methodology and all of this structure into your work every single day that still elevates, still pushes the boundaries. We're currently working on a site for a company that <clears throat> is unlike anything we've ever made. We've had developers, we've had their team, they're like, we have never seen anything like this. We had to remind them multiple times that everything in here was inclusive, accessible, and compliant. And that's the type of world we're trying to build. But, so thank you guys so much. And then any other questions you guys have? I've done it before. Yeah, I think it comes down to, I'll even just make it one. The, the top one thing to do is to be intentional. You can't understand what it is that you're, like, unless you really look at the intent, it's impossible to do the rest. And so many times the intent is, okay, let's, it could be as simple as this. I want to sell more stuff. That's, like, that's the intent of why I'm making this. Great. Now, what's the audience trying to, what's their intent? Their intent is to get information. Is it to understand how the product works? And as you start digging deeper into that, you'll start to uncover more and more and more. But if you start with the intention, you'll always be successful. Two questions. Who wants to ask the question to David? Right at the back, right at the very back. Okay, I'm running, I'm running over to you. Okay, oh, you got it? Okay, great. question, <clears throat> how, do you, how do you rapidly solve mismatches in a marketing environment? So I think that there's, I think that if I were to take this and twist it a little bit would be in a marketing sense, you want to pivot constantly, right? Because your audience is adapting and changing. So that pivot's going to happen. But from a mismatch sense of like, how do you create an inclusive environment for, for anybody? The, the foundation is building it correctly from the beginning. 
and building it with that in mind. And then that allows you to pivot and change at a much rapid, at a faster pace. The, the problem that we run into 90% of the time when any company comes and says, I want to make a pivot, it's a limit. They run into a limitation of their actual environment. They have too much technical debt and they're unwilling to cut off the dead branches. And so <clears throat> it's usually less of like a, how can you do it versus a willingness within the company? So what I always like to look at, and that's why including the point about how much potential revenue is from this is that that's what the conversation you really are going to have to present to anybody that you at your at your companies. It's going to say we're going to open the biggest part for any startup or any company is to get more users, sell more product. And if you don't approach this with the inclusive design lens, you're excluding 13ish percent of the global population. Now, depending on where your product market fit, that number could be even higher. And that doesn't sound like a lot when you're like, oh, 13%, that's casual. It's like when people say, oh, colorblindness, that's 8%. Okay, we'll take 8% of the total amount of revenue you want to have, and then that's become yeah, substantial. For this opportunity, for sure. So. Okay, so David, I think that was amazing. Um, we're kind of short on time, good. so I'm going to like, if you have any additional questions for the, David, please come and grab him. But you do want to say one the, kind of Yeah, question. the other thing I was going to say is that sometimes this can feel really daunting. And... And whenever you approach this topic, you can feel like, am I going to say the wrong thing? Am I going to, when you're talking to people, am I going to do the wrong thing? Something that I would love to help out with is if anyone has any needs or wants anything looked at, it's like we're happy to look at it from an accessibility standpoint, which is like your checklist. And then also I'm happy to look at it through the lens and helping you shift that mindset into the lens of inclusive um, methodology. So happy to do it. Find me. I'm happy to like, we could set something up. It's really, it would be a pleasure to work with any of you and just kind of do a quick free little audit of kind of your situation and how we can help change that frame. Thank you. Thank you.